the reason the Son of God appeared was to, de just to destroy, was to destroy the works of the devil. 1 John 3, 8. That through death, Hebrews 2, 14, that through death he might, what? Put to death the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil. Hebrews 2, 14. But then Paul writes this. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Romans 16, 20. So John says this, that the reason, the purpose behind Jesus coming to earth was to fulfill the divine role of being the destroyer of Satan's works. And then the author of Hebrews tells us the means by which Jesus will obtain this victory. Jesus will use his own death to defeat death. Now, how is this possible? Because our Jesus is both the lion and the what? The lamb. And then finally, the apostle Paul names the devil. He calls him Satan. And with all that he wrote to the saints in Rome, he only used one sentence to convey one thing about him, that he will soon be crushed under our feet. And here's the crazy thing. He says this, that the God of peace is the one responsible for that crushing. How beautiful is that? How poetic is that? Now, you may be asking yourself, hey, Tim, are you aware that it's the Christmas season? Isn't this supposed to be the most wonderful time of the year? Right, right? I'm aware of that. You may be asking yourself, Tim, isn't Christmas all about love, joy, and peace? And I would say I agree with you with all three of those things, but here's my reason. It's about love, joy, and peace because love himself came from heaven to earth and his children, his sons and daughters should have joy that he, Jesus, will one day crush Satan under our feet, that he came to destroy the works of the devil. And we should have peace, saints, knowing that the devil, death, and Hades will be thrown into the lake of fire. Merry Christmas, Radiant Church. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Listen, Christmas is a magical moment, but let us not forget this, that Christmas is also a missional moment. It's a missional moment. And today I want us to remind ourselves as we look at the story of God found in the Bible about how God accomplished this mission for our good and for his glory. So if you have your Bibles, and I hope that you do, please turn to Matthew. Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1, we're going to read one verse, verse 18. Gospel of Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Word of God says this, Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. The title of today's message is this, Jesus Wins. Jesus Wins, let's pray. Father, we love you. Jesus, we adore you. Holy Spirit, we desperately need you. God, you are God and we are yours. Give us now ears to hear your word, but also make us joyful doers of your word. In Jesus' name, and the whole church said, amen. amen, amen. Now, I believe for us to fully grasp and appreciate what Matthew is writing in his gospel, we have to go back to the beginning. We have to think about what happened where it all started in the book of Genesis so that we can see that this is something major, right? So let me do a little recap real quick. Genesis 1, God speaks and things happen. He don't have to lift a finger to do work, amen? So he speaks, things happen, right? Our, our world is created, and since God is good, reality reflects his nature and his character, so much so that Genesis 1, says this, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very 
good. And then you have Genesis 2. God creates Adam and Eve, right? He creates the human race both in his image and his likeness and gives them dominion to rule over everything that he created, which was very good. But here we go, Genesis 3. We're introduced to the serpent who challenges and even questions the very words of God. He deceives Adam and Eve. Sin enters the world and impacts every inch of creation. What was once very good is now very broken. Let me give you your attention in Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 to 15. Let's see what God does. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, Cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. Verse 15, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He, everyone say he, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. If you ever wonder where the gospel started, it started right here in the book of Genesis. Right here in verse 15, God promised to wage war and crush the enemy through a promised warrior who, and don't miss this, will come through the womb of a woman. Her offspring, her seed. God told the the serpent that day that, listen, a day is coming when a baby will be born and he will defeat you. The timing of this conversation, you got to get this, it's important to note. This is before God explained to Adam and Eve the consequences of their sin. This is before Adam and Eve are cast out of the garden. What does our God, our Father, do before he addresses the sins of humanity? He prophetically and emphatically says, Satan, you are done. He prophetically and emphatically says, hey, victory is coming. It's coming. It's guaranteed. The serpent is a liar and a deceiver. The Bible says that he is the father of lies. But one day, a baby is coming, and we know his name is Jesus, and we know that he is truth, and he will deliver people from their sin, and he will execute the accuser of the brethren. Merry Christmas. So when Matthew writes, now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in his way when his mother had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. This is the turning point that all of time has been waiting for. This is the reality of what God prophetically said back in Genesis chapter 3. When you get to Matthew chapter 1, your bones should shake. Because you better believe Satan knew what was going on. This is the turning point. Listen to what Paul says in Galatians 4. He says, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, under the law to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. God the Father sent his son, the Redeemer, to purchase our salvation and our Adoption, when the fullness of time had come, the appointed time, meaning this, that God deemed that time just right. Just right. When speaking of this time, this turning point, Mark says this in his gospel. He says, now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God, saying, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Now, the commentary of John's arrest is very important for us to really understand what Jesus is saying here in the text, right? John, this is John the Baptist, whose birth was miraculous as well. And what was he born? What was he put on earth to do? To prepare the way of who? The Lord, to prepare the way in the Lord. And here comes this man named Jesus, and he says this, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. To prayer phrase, what one author said, he said this, there is a shape to time. There is something that has been going on up to now that has been anticipating this moment. And what Jesus is saying is that the time, the moment that has been anticipated has now come because I'm here. 
Essentially, what Jesus is saying is, oh, yeah, you remember John? And he said, I'm here to prepare the, way, prepare the way of the Lord. I am the Lord that he was preparing for. Jesus arrives on a scene that he calls himself the way. So if you really put two and two together, John the Baptist was preparing the way for the way. And the way shows up. And his name is Jesus. And his name is Jesus. Jesus, this birth is what all of history has been waiting for. Why? Because Jesus is the offspring, the seed of woman who was promised by God to come when he was speaking to the serpent in the garden. Jesus wins. Jesus wins. So question, does Satan just sit back? Does Jesus let the choir of angels sing? Does he just let gifts be done? How does Satan respond to the birth of Jesus? Well, Matthew tells us in Matthew 2, it says, Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. Question, who do you think was behind Herod's work here? You think this is just an idea he had? Mm, I'm going to kill some babies. No, well, who do you think was behind this? Paul says in Ephesians 6, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers and against authorities, against cosmic powers over the present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but church, let's not misinterpret what Paul is saying. He's not saying that Satan won't use flesh and blood to fight against us. So what does Satan do? Satan used Herod to try to kill Jesus. This evil is clearly seen when Matthew says this. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious. And he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem. And in all the region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. Whew, man, if this seems dark to you or if you ever wondered or questioned if God is still in control when confronted with the evil of this world, let me remind you of this. Jesus wins. Jesus wins. See, when an angel told Joseph to flee to Egypt to protect Jesus, right? Matthew says this, this was to fulfill what the Lord has spoken by the prophet out of Egypt, I'll call my son. When speaking of what Herod did to all the children, Matthew also writes, then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. This is the key. The devil, Satan, tried to destroy the works of God, and he put Herod and his minions to work. But what Satan didn't know, when he was working to destroy God, he was actually destroying himself because God already said it was going to happen. Satan was actually fulfilling prophecy when he was trying to destroy the Prince of Peace. And had no clue. Jesus wins, church. I'm getting excited right now. Jesus wins. The devil could not prevent the birth of Jesus. Jesus wins. Jesus knew this as well. People question if Jesus knew his authority. He knew his authority. Jesus knew how powerful he was and the authority that he had. Listen to what Jesus says about himself in the Gospel of John. He says, for this reason, the Father loves me. Because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my accord. And I have the authority to lay it down, and I have the authority to take it up again. This charge I received from my Father. Church, Jesus wins. The devil cannot control the death of Jesus. The devil cannot stop the resurrection of Jesus. The devil is now and one day will be obliterated by Jesus. Jesus wins. Jesus wins. Let us not forget who Jesus really is, church. Let us not forget. And I'm not talking about the second coming hunger game revelation Jesus who comes back and just wrecks everything. I'm talking about the baby born in a manger, the baby who is the son of a carpenter, the one who is the son of a young woman. I'm talking about that Jesus who straight out of does anything good come out of Nazareth, Jesus. He was powerful. He was man, but he was the God man. He wasn't a man waiting to come to earth. He was God who had to put on flesh. Can I get an amen? This Jesus wins. This Jesus wins. 
Let me show you that he knew who he was right on earth. Mark wrote this, and immediately there, there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, right? We're about to see an exorcism go down right here in the Bible. And he cried out, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing and, and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. And they were all amazed. So they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region in Galilee. Tim, how do you know that Jesus wins? Jesus wins so much that even demons tremble in his presence. Jesus wins so much, don't miss what Mark said, that even unclean spirits must obey his word. Jesus wins. Jesus wins. Jesus wins in every way, at all time, at all time, every time, for all times, Jesus wins. Jesus never once bowed the knee to Satan. Think about this, church. Let me talk about you. Ready? I'm going to talk about me, but I'm going to talk about you because I have the mic, so I'm going to talk about you. How easy is it for us to sin? How easy it is for us to lose our way? Think about it. Jesus never budged. Never bowed the knee. Never sinned once. Never sinned once. Why? Because Jesus wins. Do y'all remember when Satan tried to tempt him? When did Satan take him up on a high mountain and try to tempt Jesus? The Bible says that Jesus was doing something, right? Jesus was doing his seek service, right? After 40 days and 40 nights of fasting, the devil comes and he tries to tempt Jesus. He tries to tempt him, but Jesus doesn't even budge once. Jesus wins, church. How do I know that? Because Satan, even on his best day, can't even make Jesus fall when he's on his worst day. Jesus wins. Jesus wins. The gospel, we have to remind ourselves, declares our salvation, but it also declares Satan's defeat. Listen, we're not saved if he's not defeated, church. We're not saved unless he's done. Tim, where are you finding that? Listen to what Paul says in Colossians 2. And you, I'm going to talk about you, and you who are dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. What did God do? God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all of our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with this legal demands. Did y'all hear the gospel right there? Let's keep going. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Jesus removed the validity behind, oh, Jesus removed the validity, the power behind Satan's accusations of the sons and daughters of God. Why? By taking our place, dying on a cross, declaring us forgiven. And when he did this, the Bible says he shamed the devil. That's not something that some t-shirt came up with. That's scripture. He shamed the devil. He shamed him. Let me show you this in Revelation chapter 12. It says, and the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power of the kingdom of God and the authority of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God. And and they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows that his time is short. Satan lost his case against the sons and daughters of God because we have victory in Jesus. Jesus wins. 
We are victorious in Jesus. His desire, Satan's desire for us to be penalized for our sins won't come to pass because Jesus paid it all. And he paid it in full. Jesus paid for your salvation. And the scripture says, now there is no condemnation for those who are what? In Christ Jesus. When Satan tries to stand before God and accuse you, Jesus only has to show him the scars in his body and say, I already paid for that. Jesus wins. Jesus wins. Listen, Satan may kill our bodies, but he can't touch our souls. And the reason we see and experience the wrath of God based off all that I just read, the wrath of Satan based on what I just read, is because he knows his time is what? He knows his time is short. Here's the crazy thing, though. If it's true that Jesus wins, hopefully you, you're getting a the theme here. If it's true that Jesus wins, it's also true that we win. If it's true that Jesus wins, it's also true that we win. That we win. Well, how do we win? First Peter says this, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Let me stop right there. Some of you, you need to stop playing with your sin, because if you don't kill it, it will kill you. Satan's not trying to play with you, so stop playing with him and stop playing his game. He is looking to destroy you, so Jesus came to destroy him. Jesus wins, church. You have victory, so don't play with this guy. Don't play with him. He's seeking to devour. The Bible's not being, it's not exaggerating right now. The Satan just doesn't want you to have a hard time. The saints just don't want to like mess up your calendar, ruin your sale, mess up your outfit. He wants to take you out. Listen, church, stop playing. Repent and believe the gospel. Repent, turn and believe. You need to believe in the serpent slayer. Because if you don't, Bob, about your stuff, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to say it. Nope, I'm not going to say it. Nope. Listen, listen. It says, resist him, speaking of Satan, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being expressed by your brotherhood throughout the whole world. And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you into his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be dominion forever and ever. Amen. How do we win? How do we win? We humble ourselves. We cast aside our pride because we know we have no chance against the devil and his demonic forces unless we're under the mighty hand of God. That's why Paul says in Ephesians, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Listen, church, it's not our strength. It's not our power, nor is it our armor. It's the Lord's. And how gracious is it that we have a father who is willing to share his strength, his power, and his armor to all of his children so that we can stand against the devil. Jesus wins. That means we win. That means we win. One of my spiritual fathers who prays for me daily he sent me a text this week on Tuesday. He didn't know what I was teaching on or anything. We haven't spoke in a couple of weeks. And I want to read to you what he, what he sent me. Listen, he calls me Sonny. So it starts like this. It says, Sonny, you are living in perilous times. Are you well? Just remember 
that we are called sheep in the scriptures because no matter how tough we are in the flesh, and Sonny, you are tough, we are no match for the spirit world. But it's not about our strength. It's about the strength of our shepherd. Watch what he says. The sheep are easy to defeat, but touch a sheep and you will have to deal with the shepherd of the flock. And that will be the end of the intruder. Praise God, church. Merry Christmas. Jesus wins. Jesus wins. Church, we resist the devil. We will suffer, but God will restore us. God will confirm us. God will strengthen us. God will establish us. And in one story we see this in Scripture is what happened to Peter. Y'all remember what happened to Peter when Jesus was about to be arrested? And he told Peter, you're going to deny him. Peter's like, nah, I'm not. Peter, Peter, shut up, Peter. Like, just, Jesus is right, bro. Chill. But listen, it gets really crazy, man. This is spiritual battle. This is spiritual warfare. Listen to what, what, what Jesus tells Peter. He says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you. I need you to get this. He's not exaggerating. Satan came to God and said, I want Peter. I want him. He didn't ask, he demanded. Well, why is that? Why does he want Peter? Well, y'all remember when people ask, when, when, the, when Jesus turns to the disciples and says, who do men say that I am? And some said he was Elijah, some said he was another prophet. But Peter says, you are the son of God. You're the true and living God. And Jesus turns to, to Peter and says, oh man, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father, this is spiritual revelation. This is a father showing you who, who I am. And upon that profession of faith, I'm going to build my church because this is the solid ground. This is the rock. So Satan wanted Peter, not because Peter was the rock, but because of what Peter professed about the rock. Satan wanted to uproot the foundation of the church that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is the Son of God. And he comes to Jesus and Satan says, I want him. What does Jesus say? But, oh, I love when God, oh yeah. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Satan comes, says, I want Peter, I want to sift him like wheat. And Jesus says, no, sir. I've prayed for you, Peter. And when you turn, meaning, yeah, you're going to deny, but guess what? Because I pray for you, your denial of me does not override what I say about you. And you're going to deny me, but you're going to turn. Oh, you're going to turn. And when you turn, I got a job for you to do. You're going to strengthen your brethren. And I'm going to use you to change the world. Satan may want us. Satan may want to destroy us. But by God's grace, the same Jesus that prayed for Peter is the same one that prays for us today. He is our high priest who sits at the right hand of the Father and he daily makes intercession for each and one of his kids. Jesus wins. Jesus wins. Listen, if, even if, oh man, I gotta say it. Even if Satan kills us through persecution, or some other means, even if he destroys this flesh, this body, listen to what Jesus says. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. And I and the Father are one. Come what may, I will obey Jesus. 
Come what may, I will obey Jesus. Why? Because Jesus wins. And, in it, and even if he kills me, guess what? I win. Because for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. And it's to hope. Oh, we're called to be the light of the world. We should not be afraid of the dark. That's why I'm spending a whole Christmas message on Satan, because I'm not afraid of the one that Jesus will destroy. Greater is he that is in us than he who's what? In the world. The gospel says you are caught out of darkness into marvelous light. Live like it. Enjoy it. I am tired of people saying 2020 is the worst year. If you think 2020 is hard, you have no idea what's coming. Cheer up, saints. It's going to get worse. Are you kidding me? Do you read the Bible? Jesus promised suffering. And we're all like, we're suffering. It's like, I promised it. What's the problem, man? Where's the victory? Where's the victory? Is this not the year of the Lord? Is this not the day that the Lord has made? Shall we not rejoice and be glad in it? I don't care about the coronavirus, the pandemic, or an election because my eyes are fixed to heaven. It's not fixed on things of the earth. Jesus wins. That should give you happiness. That should give you joy. It should give you a persevering peace. He will soon crush Satan under our feet. Under our feet. If you're here tonight, you're wondering if I'm okay. I'm okay. <laughs> we had a Christmas party for church. The staff, it was great. My wife and I just moved into our new home. Oh, it's great. 2020, actually, is a great year for us. And some of you are offended by that because you're not seeing the victory that Christ has won for you. And it's hard for you to rejoice with those who rejoice because you're so stuck on your weeping that you can't see victory. Listen, Jesus wins. Jesus wins. But we do have an enemy. We do. He's real. He knows his time is short. And listen, if 2020 is going to show us anything, it shows us that he has been busy. Well, it's time for us to go to work. And it's time for us to rise up as the saints of God, as the sons and daughters of God, and to take back what the enemy has stolen from us. In Radiant Church, it begins in the house of God. Let's all stand. Prayer partners come to the front. I want us to end just by praying. And legit praying. Not just closing a service prayer. Like we're turning this into a prayer session. Jesus said that his house should be called a house of what? Of prayer. We are going to pray. And when we pray, we're going to believe that heaven's going to hear. And we're also going to believe that that our enemy is going to be upset because we have a real enemy. We, have a real, we need to pray with that war mentality because this is war. This is a holy moment that's about to take place. We're about to pray against the evil one, against the schemes of the enemy, and we're going to pray that God's will will be done and that his kingdom will come in this place as it is in heaven. We're going to pray that heaven would evade and you're not going to just watch me as if I'm the Pope and he listens to me more than you. No, 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 no. He hears you, son and child of God. He hears you, you watching online. You're not just going to watch, you're going to pray. And we're going to seek the Lord for the next couple of years. You're just going to pray and we're going to pray and we're going to pray. And listen, we're not going to pray just waiting for something to happen. We're going to pray because our victory has already happened. Jesus has already went to the cross. He's already went to the grave, but the grave is now empty. We're not going to pray so that we can experience victory. We're going to pray because we have the victory. We're going to pray. And if you're here today and, and, and you don't have a relationship with God, listen, I'm, put, I'm drawing the line in the sand. Jesus said you're either for me or you're against me. You do not 
Hear, hear the gospel call. You do not want to be on the losing side. You do not. So if you have doubt or you know you haven't confessed that Jesus is Lord, you have not bowed the knee and given your life and your allegiance to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, tonight, well today, I'm watching online, hey today, I invite you to come down and say, man, I don't know what this crazy preacher's been talking about. I don't get it all, but I need to get Jesus. And we have some prayer partners here who will love to tell you more about him. But if you need prayer for anything, as I pray and as you pray, just come up and receive prayer. Right now, close your eyes, bow your heads, and begin to pray right now. Begin to thank God for the victory that he has won. Seriously, lift your voices. This is nothing cute, this is war. Lift your voices. Fill your homes with the voice of the saints, with songs from heaven. And thank Jesus for the victory. Thank him for saving you. Plead the blood of Jesus over your life, over your spouses, over your family, over your future. Yes, Father. We praise you, Father. God, we say we love you, God. We thank you for who you are. God, we thank you for sending your son, Jesus. Jesus, thank you for coming. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being willing to be a servant. Thank you for being willing to die on the cross. Thank you, Jesus, for being willing. Jesus, thank you for winning. Jesus, thank you for fighting. Jesus, thank you for praying, God. Thank you for interceding for us right now as we pray. Come on, church, pray, pray, pray. We pray, we pray. May your kingdom come, may your will be done. Father, we pray that you would make us dangerous against the kingdom of darkness. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would fill us with a boldness and a passion, Lord God, to, to go into the dark places, to go to the lost places and to proclaim the gospel that brings life, that brings peace, that brings joy, God, to a world that desperately needs it. God, we say, here we are, send us. Here we are, God, send us, use us. God, we're no longer afraid. God, we declare you have not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Lord God, we take up the armor of God. God, and we say, we charge. We move forward. We say, we are yours. We say, the earth is yours. We say, Lamb of God, receive the reward of your suffering. We say that every tribe, every tongue, and every nation should know that you are Lord. Oh, Holy Spirit, fill us right now. Empower us right now. Give us a, a holy fire. God, a holy conviction that changes our lives. Would you mark us this, this day? Mark us. Oh, God, we repent and we believe. We repent and we believe. We believe. Come on, tell them you believe in them. Say, God, I believe. I believe. I believe in who you are. I believe in what you've done. I believe in the victory that you have won. Tell them, I believe. I believe, but help me if I have any unbelief, God. Give us faith. Give us faith. Give us hope. Pray, church. Keep praying. This is war time. Keep praying. Keep praying. Oh, Satan, you cannot have us because Jesus prayed for us. Satan, you can't have my kids. Satan, you can't have my family. Satan, you can't have my future because Jesus prayed for us. Oh God, Satan, you can't have us. We belong to the Lamb of God. We belong to the Lion of Judah. We belong to the Prince of 
Prince of Peace, we belong to the King of Kings. We belong to the Lord of Lords. Yes, God. Yes, God. Father, we humble ourselves under your mighty hand, under those nail-pierced hands. We humble ourselves under your mighty hand. We ask you that you would exalt us as we cast our anxieties, our cares, our doubts, and our fears on you. Give us the strength to resist the evil one. Give us the strength to walk with you, to be with you, to live for you and you alone. In the holy, precious, powerful, and victorious name, in Jesus' name, we pray. And the church said, amen, amen, amen.